which are you know, part of uh, which I listened here. One was on the surgical induced astigmatism, and one from Imam Shu. And uh, something which uh, which always excites me is the way the astigmatism behaves in different people at different points of time. So if you're just classifying it, we are based on etiology. It could be just a primary where you don't know why there's an astigmatism, or the secondary, which we all know the different causes of it. Uh, the question is, how do you define a, a irregular astigmatism? That is also very important because when you're looking at the topography, it's based on the skewing from the center and this angle alpha, anything more than 20 degrees. I'm not very happy with the definition, but this is all the best we have, and it's a pretty old uh, paper out here. The sources of it starts from the tear film. We all know the rest, but let's assume that it's tear film also could play a very important role in your way your astigmatism is calculated. A poor tear film with a poor myobomian gland dysfunction, evaporative eye disease, could have a different change on your topography itself. So diagnosis is, by all this means, I'm not going into this aspect of it because this course is very specific. So what I added uh, just when the present two uh, speakers were doing is this few things. Because Surgical induced astigmatism, a lot of uh, techniques of correcting it, everything has to have a reason why it behaves in some and why it fails in many. So what we thought was these four things probably would help us to understand in future how do you control everything, including your surgical induced astigmatism of less than, even if you go less than one millimeter incision. First, let's look at the foundation of the cornea. This particular thing at the cellular foundation was uh, given to me by uh, my research director, Arka Ghosh, he designed it himself. It, if you really decompose the cornea in the very, very small cellular components, and each cellular component actually determines how it behaves to different surgical procedures. For example, you have tears, which is filled with inflammation, and inflammation can actually change a lot of your uh, well-done surgery. Epithelium and the bombments, and you have different collagen out here. But what's very interesting here is the collagen 1 and the lysyl oxidase. These two are responsible for kind of strength of your cornea. The collagen 4 is the, bom the Bowman's and basement membrane complex. So it means that if your cornea has less of locks and less of collagen 1, it would behave in a completely abrupt way compared to what you want to be. Like you mentioned about the astigmatism. When you're looking at the mathematics, it should behave in a particular format. But we all know that always it does not behave. And suddenly you have one off which behaves completely different. So this is the foundation, what we need to keep in mind. And this is one of the most important things when things go wrong. And when we did the, this is uh, the patients of our donor cornea and from the keratoconus. Very interesting here is there's no lysyl oxidase only in the patient with keratoconus. And you can see this is expressed on the epithelium and absolutely nil. There's absolutely nil collagen and absolutely zero collagen 4, which is the Bowman's complex, uh, sorry, Bowman's basement complex. That means that the disease corneas do have foundation which is completely abnormal compared to the corneas, what is doing in a normal eye. So sometimes when you have an irregular astigmatism, there could be hidden disease in them. When I say disease, it could be something not just keratoconus, it could be anything which we don't know still. That's one of the most important thing. And all this actually contributes to the biomechanics. How the cornea behaves is completely based on all that foundation what you saw, because lysyl oxidase and collagen actually makes the cornea to behave like this. Stronger foundation actually means a stronger cornea. And when you have a cornea which is weaker, definitely your, your, all your parameters would change. For example, this is a slide which I borrowed from Matthew. He keeps presenting it all the time. A small incision can cause three or four directors sudden change in your cornea. And when we looked at this particular patient's biomechanics, even though it was not a keratoconic eye, it, his, his biomechanics was worse than a keratoconic eye. We call it the deformation amplitude, which was 1.30 and above, which means that there is some hidden pathology which we did not know. And the third important factor is how the epithelium remodulate after you do a surgery. For example, you put an incision here, and that area, the epithelium is really caused in hyperplastic change, and the other side is completely normal. And we all know, like in this slide, there's a 53 and a 76 in the center, and you can see that there is one axis is 52, other is 71. Epithelium itself can cause a refractive change. And there's a paper out here, close to 18 microns of change of epithelium. For example, if you go back and see, there's close to more than 18 to 20 microns of change. And this itself can cause a diopter of change in your refractive error. That means 
factors which we need to know is one is the foundation, the second is the biomechanics, the third is the epithelium. And after we know all this, we can actually use what uh, beautifully you explained about your surgical induced astigmatism parameters into something called as a mathematical modeling. The future of all surgical based things will be worked on a mathematical modeling. It's not that you're going to try it on a patient. Here, all you need to do is there have been two ways of looking at it. It's pure mathematics. It's not my slides as I borrowed it from Abhijit. What you do is, one is, you assume a lot of stuff. That means you assume that the cornea is, has got a strength of X parameter, and then you assume, and then you derive the strength. The second one is inverse method, where you can get all the parameters from your machines, and then you get it. And that inverse method is what is going to be the future, what is going to help us to predict how the outcome of every surgery is going to be. I feel envisioned that in the next 10 years, I think all a machine will have this uh, parameters built in, so virtually you'll predict, okay, this is what is going to happen to this patient post-op, whether you're doing a LASIK or any procedure, and this is how they do. You ha it's like each level of cornea, you're looking at stress and strain relationship, and you get a parameters, and also you have to dampen the globe, because the globe also plays a in the tension, so you had to negate the effect of globe and virtually get only the cornea. Otherwise, everything else plays a role and you don't know from where it's going to come. The second uh, important about astigmatism is uh, about the posterior corneal astigmatism. In a normal eye, it may not play a much important role, but when you do a post-surgical eye, then it might have an important uh, aspect to it. What is interesting is the cornea changes from with the rule to against the rule as it keeps moving, but the posterior astigmatism remains stable. That is a very, very important point to know. But in the anterior cornea, that's because the anterior cornea actually remodels. It means it biomechanically it becomes different. That is why it changes, where in the posterior cornea it does not. So coming to the my topic about uh, irregular cornea, you're keeping the time, right? So when the irregular cornea is about uh, some of these cases, for example, many times we get this patient's perfectly centered uh, ablation, the patient is just not happy. If you really look at this, even though it looks perfectly centered, because we, we love colors, colors, green, blue colors means we are very happy that it's completely centered. You can see that there is a four to five diopters of astigmatism in the pupillary region. That means that even in that region, that these are the patients who will end up in a vision like this. When you make them read a Snell and visual uh, chart, they read six by six. Just keep them dilated eyes, and you could see that there is a dip, and this patient's and a 7.5 millimeter pupil, the pupil, the whole of refraction changes it's from the a perfectly normal eye in at a four millimeter pupil, and it actually becomes more myopic when the pupil becomes 7.5. This is the same patient, and I've just used this machine to predict how at each level his vision completely changed. I used two different optics machines to measure this, but it just tells us that seeing at a four millimeters what we see, the patient in our room, and we see that he's perfect, but just make him just dilate his eyes and that's what you see. For them, we need to do something. And that's where we come to this topic today. We can treat the wavefront. We all have used to uh, treating the wavefront aberration or something new called as a topo guided, where you just treat the topo guide, topography uh, changes. Uh, if you really look at this, what does the topography does? It, when you look at a topography aberration, it tries to correct the, the topography of the anterior surface. But there are times when you want to correct the whole cornea. Topography doesn't work on a full cornea. Just looking at the topography maps from the anterior surface, and it tries to correct. And we need, when you're looking at the complete cornea, ideally, you have to look at an aberration guided treatment. But unfortunately, it's very difficult to get a repeatable values, predictable values on an aberrometer. That's why we rely more on a topography because it's much easier to get the readings. For example, if you look at this, again, the same patient, you have a 38 diopters in the center, bank center, and just outside the pupil is 41. So that means minute the pupil dilates, he has coma and all kinds of aberration. And this patient has got re zero refractive error. There's nothing to correct. These are the most difficult ones. And we corrected it, and what you see here is a perfectly normal cornea, and this completely corrects his uh, problems. So irregular astigmatism could also come from a very irregular uh, corneal surface, which could be, in this case, a very highly irregular aberrations. Catoconus is one where the, the cornea is completely irregular. We just... Uh, got this in press now, uh, we call it a five-point nomogram, which comes out a complete 
a step and to get this to this we have a scoring system it's going to be published in IGO shortly most of our patients have benefit from contact lenses ketoconus is one thing where we assume that everybody needs a treatment but when your thickness is good and your disease is mild to moderate the cornea is clear you don't have a woke stray and the patient is more than 25 years that's when you probably look at a combination of a topo guided pre rk with the cross linking what does it do it makes the cornea more regular compared to what the normal thing is standard ablation assumes it's a standard fit it is a 6 mm zone it gives you a treatment and be done with it but when you're looking at this it tries to give a customized treatment it tries to area where it's needed and tries to cornea make the cornea more aspheric or more regular in shape and uh, always try to keep the ablation depth less than we are not trying to correct the refractive error here the more whole idea is to neutralize the topography so it's very important this word is the reason is if you're trying to neutralize this refractive error then you will end up in more of a problem because you cannot correct refractive error and the topography together so that is something which we need to know the whole process is you can take the images from the pentacam or the or, uh, or the topolizer it goes to central server and then you transfer it to the machine and from the machine you make a it's a process So many times people ask me is just taking the images and just treating it it's not that easy that's where the topo guided treatment needs a lot of uh, adjustment because it is not a very fine tuned mesh to treatment yet for example you take the acquisition then you have to adjust the q value q value is nothing but the shape of your cornea you need to find out what shape would fit the patient better and adjusting the q value adjusting the abrasion after all this you still get surprises so that is something which we need to keep in mind and for example if you look at this this is how the ablation looks and if you look at this this is an irregular cornea after the treatment it makes it more regular uh there are few things which we need to know about what is good and bad outcomes uh many when we started off we were trying to treat all kinds of cornea this just got accepted in ajo uh when you're looking at the cone itself and we use the q protocol where you you adjust the q values according to the change of cone uh it's a little complex because uh, you have to look at the topography each case is different and each case has to be planned it that way for example the best case if somebody wants to try a laser to begin with is one of this you have a central cone the ablation is central and you probably get a perfect results the minute the cone goes outside that means the machine has to do a lot of calculation it's an algorithmic calculation to treat the area of cone and also to treat on the other side like imam shu said you have to balance everything you just can't treat one area if you treat one area the other eye other side would change so just to balance everything it tries to give you a complete pattern and this is what you would see and uh, for example you can see from here that you know just by a good algorithmic approach with a minus 3 minus 3 you are able to achieve a 6 6 vision with a perfect central cornea and this is again one more patient you can see it's a 43 and 3 diopters of cylinder and you can see the cornea is completely flattened out and these are the results it's not that we expect this kind of in all patient we do have surprises but again when i have a surprise i know that there's something changes in the foundation of this cornea out there and what we are trying to achieve at the end of it is not trying to make him completely neutralize of his refractive error what we try to remove is this kind of the band out here minute you remove the shadow this can always be corrected with the glasses or the contact lenses the what the patient has a problem is the shadows out here so this is one case of a pellucid margin degeneration there are times we had to combine things pmds are very difficult to treat intacts don't work on them lasers don't work on them because it's a two periphery to treat what we did is we just did a, a limited laser got the cornea to be on a more uh, regular shape you can see the q value which was more flatter lesser to zero is flatter when it's very steep you can see it's becoming more minus sometimes suddenly it becomes minus it means that the cone your cornea is becoming more regular and that's what happened this is a difference map what has happened here and after a month we try to treat the same patient with uh, the intact rings and the q values again becomes normal and the patient had a minus 7 diopter cell with the plus 2 and what he has is a minus 2 and half diopter and he's got a 6 9 vision and these are ones which makes you believe that using the technology in a right way sometimes really help and the question always asked to me is which is better the abrometry guided or the topography even though i do a lot of topo guided treatment if you can get a good repeatable readings i think any day abrometry is the best value i'll show you why it, this happens this is the one patient where i treated 
you can see that at the end of it, what do you want in a treatment? You want a perfectly aspheric cornea. That means the cornea in the center should not be too flat. And if you really look at it, the center has not become flat. It's the peripheries what is gradual flattening compared to uh, a topogadic treatment where it's, even though it claims that it's, it's aspheric, it's not truly aspheric at some point of time. So if you get a good reading, if you have a good abrometer, abrogated treatment are always going to be the best. Can I have a, one more minute? Yep. The future of cross-linking in an irregular cornea is moving towards uh, the regular cross-linking, which now I call it more like a carp carpet plumbing to more like a cruise missile technology-based treatments, where you're trying to target only the area of cone and not trying to bother about the other area because you believe that the area of the cone is one which is more weak. And this is one of the treatments. You can see the change. We have only treated the area of the cone, and you can see that the area of flattening achieved is quite significant. We don't know how long it will hold on, but it's definitely going to be one of the, thing, one of the things to be looked for in the future. Uh, I have one more, uh, just two more slides before I sum up. One of the most important thing post cataract surgery is one of the dreaded things is to find a patient who has got a very bad LASIK surgery. And many of them, you have this is how a normal would look on an EKR, effective keratometry reading, and this is how a LASIK would look, and this is how an RK would look. And um, trust me, you're going to get loads of them coming to your practice because LASIK done in the last two decades are going to come for surgery now and how would you actually look at the refractive error and how would you actually treat these patients is going to be very difficult. So what we decided was in the same patient, this is how the patient was seeing and if you put any intraocular lens of any lens for him, he's going to still say the same because the cornea is the one which is having an issue. So what we did was we started treating this patient, we lift the flap, same flap, if the flap is not irregular, recut the flap or do a PRK, don't treat the refractive error, correct the corneal just correct the cornea, make it normal, and then after that put a lens. And we call it the corneal customization. And this is how it looks. For example, this is a very small zone with a small, uh, uh, and you can see the cornea, this is from the lens, and you can see the cornea is completely irregular. And with this treatment, the cornea became completely normal, and this is something which we can take care of with an intraocular lenses. This is my last slide, and this is how it is. This is from the lens, this is from the cornea, and this is what he's seeing. If I remove this lens, he still will have a blurred vision because this is what he's going to see from his cornea because cornea is the first image. So what we did was we corrected the cornea, enlarged the zone, removed the aberration, and later we just put the lens and this is what he's seen at the end of it. And this is something which we need to know because this is going to be a big problem in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Rohit. Uh,